Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Crime Uncut. In this video today, I will be looking at the tragic death of 29-year-old Willem Creer. Just because my channel is called Crime Uncut, I am by no means implying that his death was as a result of a crime. But before I start, I just want to express my heartfelt condolences to Willem's family for their loss. I'm praying for your peace and comfort. Just a short recap. After a stag party at the lodge, at the Henbase Lodge and Resort near Margaretson in Mapumalanga, on Sunday, November the 13th, 2022, Willem and his truck went missing. An extensive search was conducted of the surrounding area, as well as of the Fall River, which you can see running here right adjacent to the resort. The search of the river was complicated and difficult because it was in flood for a couple of days after Willem's disappearance. Eventually, Willem and the truck were found in the river on November the 22nd. It was a Tuesday. Currently, the police, as well as a quite a large number of people, believe that Willem's death was not an accident but a murder. And then the report newspaper recently reported on the front page that the police alleged that Willem's truck was only placed in the river the day before it was found and that they are now treating this case as a homicide. This is at odds with investigation conducted by advocate Gary Nell from Avery Forum, who at the behest of Willem's family investigated Willem's death and after studying amongst others the autopsy reports, phone records, GPS records, etc., concluded that Willem's death was just an accident. In this video, I'm going to take a critical and logical look at the arguments presented by the police and those that support their arguments of murder. Then I will also look at the evidence and the arguments that Willem's death was simply an unfortunate accident. Before we begin, it's important to accept that much of what has been stated as fact in the media or social media is nothing but conjecture, unproven, and some of it is blatantly false. With that said, let's get into it. That Saturday morning, Willem arrived at the lodge with a friend called Kali. Previously, two chalets were booked, one for him and one for Kali. And these chalets were in this block over here. It turned out that someone else slept in the room that was booked for Willem. It seems that he likely decided to kindly offer his room to another guest because he could just bunk with his friend. The stag party was attended by about 52 young, mostly young men. And this photo shows Willem with the bridegroom and the two other guys that attended the party. The party started at about 11 in the morning and went on through the day until well after midnight the next day. According to the owners, everyone was well behaved and respectful to staff, and they were not aware of any friction or arguments between the guests. This is not to say that there weren't any incidents, just that they didn't personally observe any. That weekend, there were three other functions in the lodge, so the place was packed with people, and all the chalets were booked, with some people staying in tents and caravan in the camping grounds next to the river. CCTV footage shows Willem at the bar at about one in the morning ordering a bottle of water. He's not sure exactly when he left the party. I've seen some people say at two o'clock. Now it was initially reported that Willem made two calls to a friend called Marius. The first one at 12 past one and then the second one two minutes later. And both times the calls were not answered because Marius was asleep and his phone was in silent mode. Then in a report article, it is said that the police looked at Willem's phone records and that there is no evidence that he made these calls. Ladies and gentlemen, if you make a call to someone and you stop the call before voicemail kicks in or before the other person picks up, that phone call will not appear on your phone record nor on the other person's phone record. You will see on your phone that you made a call and that person will see on his phone that he received a call. But these attempts will not be on any of the phone records that MTN or Vodacom, for example, would be able to provide to police. 
So it seems to me quite possible that Willem did make these calls and that he just wasn't interested in leaving messages. Sadly, Willem did not make it to a chalet and was never seen alive again. Now, Willem attended a stag party with a bunch of other guys that went on till the small hours of the morning. We can safely assume that alcohol was consumed. We don't exactly know how much Willem consumed, but there were some people that said that he did not drink excessively. The question here is, what is excessive and what is not excessive? Some people may say that three beers are not excessive, but if one looks at this chart, even at the legal limit of 0.05%, it can still significantly impact your ability to operate the vehicle safely, especially in adverse driving conditions. What is excessive or not is relative and depends on the circumstances and the demands that it will make on you. That evening it started to rain and it became quite heavy after about midnight. It is said that that evening about 10 centimeters or 4 inches of rain fell, so much so that the Vall River flooded that Sunday, even covering the low water bridge and part of the camping grounds. This photo shows the extent of the flooding. Not exactly sure when this photo was taken, but I suspect it was in the Monday or the Tuesday. So when Willem, when Willem left the bar that morning, it was raining heavily. Apparently at this time, the, the low water bridge was still passable, and many people thought that he may have driven off the bridge into the river. The thing is, however, that CCTV footage as well as the truck's GPS tracker confirmed that the truck never left the lost premises that far. The reliability of this information needs to be viewed in light of the fact that Willem and the truck were found in the river adjacent to the premises nine days later with no evidence or anyone seeing the vehicle outside the premises during these nine days. So we can say with a high degree of certainty that somewhere between the bar and the chalet, Willem and his truck disappeared. And then something happened that would cause his cell phone and GPS tracker to go dead. Sometime during the Sunday, Willem was reported missing. According to the owner of the lodge, he found out at about 3 p.m. and he in turn called a friend to bring a helicopter to assist in the search. Various people, including the owner and staff and others, searched all along the river banks on both sides. We must keep in mind that at this time, the water levels would have been much higher than when it was that early Sunday morning after Willem left the bar. As such, any markings on the bank showing where the truck potentially could have gone into the river would have been covered by water and not visible to the searchers. Before we proceed, let's talk about the hydraulics of water flowing in a channel like a river. In a river, not all water flows at the same speed. The flow velocity is a minimum at the bottom and sides of the river as a result of the resistance caused by the banks in the riverbed. Then the speed of water increases inwards and upwards to reach a maximum in the middle of the river just below the surface. The significance of this will become evident later when we talk about why the vehicle did not show much damage after nine days in the water and why the wheel tracks did not wash away. According to the owner of the lodge, with the assistance of the police and members of the public, a detailed search of the premises were conducted and nothing was found. It's safe to assume that if the truck was hidden anywhere, it would have been found during this search. The police and Willem's family arrived Monday morning and the search continued. It has been reported that up to five helicopters assisted in the search. Search and rescue units from Apumalanga and Limpopo got involved and police divers that arrived came without the boat and the owner had to ask for a neighbor to bring a boat. I wouldn't say that's a good start. At that time, the river was still in full flood and the searching of the river was difficult and dangerous. This photo shows a helicopter, a jet ski and a boat in action. And this picture shows the location and the direction in which the previous photo was taken. This over here 
sticking out above the water is one of these barbecue structures, just to show you how deep the water was, even this far out from the river. Now, the divers initially dropped magnets attached to strings into the water, hoping that the magnets would stick to the vehicle. But apparently, this didn't work out too well to start off with, as the fast flowing water pulled on the strings so that the magnets would not sink as well as they would like. They then asked the owner for chains and weights to make the magnets heavier. Now would be a very good time to talk about a very important issue. That being how deep down under the water would the truck have been while the initial search efforts were going on. I'm going to show you some photos of the height of the river bank adjacent to the lodge, just to give you an idea of how deep the floodwaters would have been at the start of the police's search. On the left here, we have the low water bridge, which at the time of Willems leaving the bar was still possible, although the water level was already higher than normal. The red line shows approximately how high up the floodwaters went. In this photo, the water would have risen to beyond the tree line, almost up to the road in the back. This photo shows the bank of the river directly opposite to where the truck was found. Again, the red line shows how high the floodwaters went. It's difficult to say how high the flood level was above the normal water level. I couldn't find a contour map of the area or a, a good point of reference to use. Someone involved in the search and rescue effort mentioned that the flood level was about four to five meters higher than the level when they found the truck and that is an assessment that I would agree with. But when the truck was found, uh, one of the rescue workers stood on the roof of the truck, and I suspect that this rescuer here is standing on the roof of the truck, and I would guess he's about half a meter into the water. So we can assume that the top of the truck was between four and a half and five and a half meters below the water surface. To get an idea of how deep that is, wherever you are, just look at the ceiling above you. Now imagine water more than twice that height covering the truck, about the height of a double-story house. It would certainly not have made for an easy search effort in murky water with fast-flowing currents. This image shows the flood limits, most likely on the Monday or Tuesday. The yellow line corresponds approximately with the flood limits from this flood photo. The red line shows the approximate limit at the time the truck was found. What is also evident from these photos is that the truck was in close proximity to this tree. Here you can just see the, stop, the top of it sticking out. It seems some of the branches may have been hanging over or close to the location where the truck was found. It seems quite possible, although not definitive, that the police may have had some difficulties dropping their magnets from directly above the truck due to the obstruction caused by the canopy and the branches of the tree. In the report article, the police also said that they used drones and electromagnetic technology to look for the truck. The same technology that is used by mines to do prospecting, i.e. to look for areas with mineral deposits. The type of electromagnetometers used in prospecting measures and maps fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field. And then these maps are then used by geologists to guide further exploration. Whilst I'm no expert in this type of technology, I'm skeptical that a small object like a truck will cause a detectable anomaly in the Earth's magnetic field. So if the police use prospecting technology to look for a truck, then I think they use the wrong tool for the job. There are, however, certain types of electromagnetics attached to drones that can detect metal objects, buried weapons, pipes, etc. But it requires that the drone fly as low as possible to the ground surface, preferably less than one meter. I'm not sure that such a drone would have detected an object six meters under, up to, or five and a half meters under the water. I wish for the police to reveal details and specs of the technology they used, so we can better understand why the technology possibly failed to detect a truck. Typically, to detect underwater objects, submersible magnetometers should be used and not those that are used above the water. As with anything else in life, it's important to use the right tool for the job. If anyone has any information about the technology used, please let me know. I'm very curious. The report article doesn't mention that the police use sonar technology, but I've come across media articles and Facebook posts that mention the use of a sonar scanner. As you know, a sonar 
is a device that uses sound waves to detect objects and surfaces. By detecting sound waves that reflect back to the scanner from an object or the surface. But be as it may, it is known that the use of a sonar to detect underwater objects have certain limitations. It's not perfect. Water conditions and certain environmental factors can impede the effectiveness of a sonar to detect objects beyond a certain distance. It is known that high concentrations of sediment and microbubbles in the water can significantly impede the function of a sonar. Underground vegetation, like in this case, for example, submerged tree canopies can create blind spots. Background noise, such as, for example, from boat engines could interfere with the quality and clarity of the image that the scanner generates. Now, in a previous photo, we have seen three different sources of noise, a jet ski, a boat, and a helicopter. When the sonar searching was conducted, did the operator ask for the engines of the skis and the boats to be switched off? If you compare the brown color of the flood water with the normal green color, then it is clear that the concentration of suspended solids were quite high and almost certainly would have interfered with the function of the scanner to some extent. Admittedly, I cannot say by how much. The search continued for the whole week and the flood levels only start to recede on Wednesday. On a Thursday, the owner discovered the following marks and damage to a paved area located here right adjacent to the river. He was convinced that the damage was not there prior to the flood. On Saturday, an accident reconstructionist from Pretoria came to investigate the marks and to measure the distance between them. And he found them very similar to the distance between the wheels of the truck. It was the expert's opinion that that is where the truck entered the river. So based on the information so far, this is what I think happened. After leaving the bar, Willem drove along this laneway. It was dark, it was raining heavily. His forward visibility was, very, was likely severely compromised by the water in his windscreen and the reduced effectiveness of the headlights in a very dense rain. And on top of that, he may have had some level of impairment, even though he may not have been visibly inebriated. And he may have been driving too fast for the conditions. He missed a sharp right turn. He kept going, next moment he hits the paved area and then into the river. The truck then floated in the fast flowing currents was slowly sinking for about 65 meters before it settled in the riverbed at the approximate location of the yellow star. It's important to note that most vehicles will start floating in between 30 and 60 centimeters of water. Once in the water, the vehicle would not sink the bottom immediately, it would float and slowly start sinking as water enters the cabin through, for example, the pedal openings in the floor and air vents. Here is a video that shows what one can expect from a pickup truck that floats in flat water. As you can see, it would slowly tilt forward pulled down by the weight of the engine and by the added weight of the water seeping into the cabin. What is interesting to note is that even though the truck is almost up to the windscreen in water, the wiper blades are still moving. Even this deep, the water has not yet short-circuited the electronics to stop the blades from operating. Now let's look at how the truck might have behaved after it entered the water. In the upcoming slides, just imagine that the truck is floating towards you. Moments after entering the water, as the truck started to float, it would have been level like this. The truck would have been kept afloat by the air in the cabin and the back cargo area of the truck, which if you can imagine would act like a boat. With water seeping into the cabin through openings and vents and under the weight of the engine, the front of the truck would have started to tilt down into the water. Even at this point, it would not have been possible to open the doors because of the water pressure. Once the bottom of a car's door is even slightly submerged, the water pressure makes it almost impossible to open a door until a car is nearly full of water, which then equalizes the pressure. As more and more water seeps in, the heavier the front part becomes, and the more the truck will tilt, and the more it will sink. Eventually, the water will reach to the windscreen and beyond. Up to this point, the rate of sinking would have been relatively slow, 
and it would have depended on the rate of seepage into the cabin. If the windscreen was broken before this time, or if it was broken at this time, the water will just rush in and the cabin will fill up quickly and the truck will sink at a much faster rate. Then eventually, a point will be reached where the cargo area is breached and the water starts flowing into it. Now the back will start sinking as well and the truck will sink to the bottom like a rock. Now it has been said there was a fence and a gate and the truck would not have been able to float over the fence and gate and also that the truck doesn't show any damage that would be consistent with encountering a fence. Now judging from this aerial photo that was taken on September 11th, 2022, that would be two months before the incident, you can see that the fence come right up to the water's edge at normal water level. It does not seem to actually extend right into the river. Now during the flood, a section of this fence would have become submerged, but we need to remember that at the time that Fulham went into the river, it was only at the start of the storm, and the flood levels would not have been as high as we see in this photo, perhaps marginally higher than the normal level, and it would have been possible to float along the river to the final resting place without, um, without encountering the fence. Now coming back to the wheel marks, some may say that it would be impossible for the wheel marks to have remained there after having been covered by flood water for a couple of days, and that it would have been washed away by the flood waters. I don't think we can say that with any degree of certainty. Firstly, as I illustrated before, the water speeds are almost at zero we're at the river banks and the river bed, and we are not talking here about loose sand, but possibly compacted soil with cohesive properties that with the added assistance of the grass roots can hold its shape. According to a deputy director in Gauteng Emergency Medical Services, on Monday, November the 21st, they reached out to the search organizers and offered to assist in the search as they would have the equipment and skill to do a more thorough search. Let me repeat this, to do a more thorough search. But didn't the police already do a thorough search using their magnets, their drones and their scanners to the extent that they're making the allegations that the truck must have been placed there only the day before they found it? Well, the search organizers agreed that their help would be welcome. I guess because they were going to work outside of their jurisdiction, some paperwork had to be done. Finally, five members, which included the deputy director and the equipment were authorized to mobilize to the scene. On Tuesday, the 22nd of November, they departed Pretoria about 6.13 in the morning and arrived at the scene at about 10 minutes past nine. Someone on social media said that the rescuers were called to the scene that day because someone found a tube of lip ice and one of Willem's flip-flops near the riverbank. This is not correct. A green steel flask was found on the riverbank on the Wednesday, and a flip-flop and a lip balm were found on the Thursday. These were found within 800 meters downstream of where the truck was found. All of this was reported on by Network 24 on the Friday, the 18th of November three days before someone supposedly pushed the truck into the river. And on Monday, the day before the truck was found, someone apparently found a toiletry bag. So while the rescuers were, put, were putting up their search lines, there was a bass fishing boat nearby. And this boat had a sonar. The operator of the boat informed the rescuers that the sonar detected a strange shadow and he pointed out the location. The rescuers went to inspect and then suddenly one of the rescuers stood up out of the water and declared to everyone's surprise that he was standing on top of the truck. They were then joined by the police diver who helped them to secure cables to the truck so they could pull it to shallower and quieter waters. It was then that they confirmed that there was a body inside the truck, between the seats with his, face, with his feet facing forward and the windscreen was broken. Now someone contact, contacted the lot's owner to come assist with pulling the truck out of a big farming tractor. The owner did not volunteer. He was requested to do so by someone at the scene that had present the police diver. Perhaps not the investigating officers, but someone from the police nonetheless. 
and of course also the rescue team from Hateng. In this instance, the farmer cannot be accused of any wrongdoing. Pulling out the truck was not an easy task. As the windscreen was broken, the body inside just wanted to float out with the water. So they decided to remove the body while the truck was still half in the river. The body was pulled out the front window, and then the bloated body was floated to the bank, which was placed inside the body bag and then taken away. Thereafter, they managed to pull the truck out. As you can see, when the truck was pulled out the river, the rear wheels were very clearly locked and the front wheels rolled freely. This is consistent with the observation that the automatic transmission was in park and the handbrake was pulled up. According to experts, the truck was switched off by the time it entered the water, as the headlights didn't burn out and there wasn't a mixing of oil and water in the engine. The keys were also found on the floor and there was damage to the inside of the driver's door. Now, personally, I am dismayed that the rescue team or whoever was in charge of the scene allowed the truck to be moved and the body from it. Without allowing the police's crime scene and forensic investigators to do their work. For starters, the exact location and orientation of the truck should have been recorded. Which way was the truck facing? If possible, depending on the visibility, Underwater photos and videos should have been taken of the whole truck as well as the inside of the cabin. For example, the key that was found on the floor. Was it perhaps originally on the seat or on Willem's lap and then it just slid down to the floor as they pulled the truck up the bank? How much of the damage to the truck was caused by the rescue effort? For example, is this mirror like this because the rescuer's legs accidentally bumped into it? To some, and obviously the police as well, the relatively good condition of the truck, the engine being off, it being a park with the handbrake on, the key in the floor and the damage to the door are all unusual and provide grounds for suspicion and are at the root of the allegation that the truck was placed in the river only a day before it was found. There are also findings of the autopsy report which we will talk about later. Now the truck shows some damage on the left side and nothing on the right side. Now we need to remember we do not know the exact condition of the truck when it arrived at the lodge that Saturday morning, when it went into the river and when the rescuers found it. All we know is what it looked like when the rescuers pulled it out of the water. We can't say for certain what caused this damage. Was it pre-existing? Was it caused by some unknown event between him leaving the bar and driving into the river? Or was it caused by events in the floodwaters? Was it caused by the rescue efforts or by any combination of these? It is said that a vehicle in the water would have shown more damage. What type of damage? At the beginning of the flood, the truck would have been covered by about, say, half a meter to a meter of water, and this would have rapidly increased to between four and a half and five and a half meters. As previously discussed, the deeper you go, to slower the speed of the water. And water by itself, even if turbulent and moving at high speed, would not have caused any structural damage to the truck. Any debris in the water that could have caused damage, such as pieces of wood, would simply have floated over the truck at the surface of the river. So let's come back to the questions that will always be raised by supporters of the conspiracy. Why was the handbrake up? Why was the transmission in park? Why was the engine off? And why? were the keys, not in the ignition, and why was the right door damaged? And then I want to add one extra. Why was the back window open, considering that it was raining very hard, and it's unlikely that Willem would have left it open? Imagine what went through Willem's mind when the truck hit the water and got swept away by the current while slowly sinking in complete and utter darkness. Complete panic desperation and disorientation. Nobody trains or prepares to handle a situation like this. From the comfort of our couches, we cannot impose our rational expectations on what William should have done or should not have done. What may seem to us as unreasonable 
might have been completely reasonable to Willem in that horrifying situation where he did not have time to work things out, to weigh the pros and the cons of each action, and where all he had to do was just to act on instinct. Most likely the first thing you do is to instinctively do something, anything, just to stop the truck from moving forward. You take it out of drive, you pull the handbrake, you switch the engine off. When that didn't work, your next instinct may be to try and get out. Maybe you try the door first, but that would not have worked. It is argued that because the headlights didn't burn out and because the oil in the engine didn't mix with water, the engine was dead when the truck entered the water. I don't think one can say that with any degree of certainty. First, the truck didn't sink immediately. It floated and then slowly sank. It's unlikely that when it entered the water that the water would have so quickly seep into the headlights to burn out the bulbs or to make it into the engine to mix with the oil. It is possible that the engine was switched off before the truck was deep enough for this to occur. The damage to the door may be explained by attempts to kick the door open. As previously mentioned, it's very difficult to open a door that is even partially submerged in water. When that did not work, he moved on to the windscreen. Maybe try at first to use the keys to crack the windscreen. He also likely screamed for help and possibly opened the rear window to increase the chances that someone would hear him. If it is true that the windscreen was already broken when the rescuers found the truck, it seems that Willem was successful in breaking the windscreen, most likely by kicking it out. But obviously it was too late. The water poured in and likely overwhelmed him, and he could not get out in time. Keep in mind that it would have been so dark that he would not have been able to see his hand in front of his face. Two autopsies were performed in Willem, one by a state pathologist and one by a private pathologist retained by Willem's family. Unfortunately, I've not been able to set my eyes on any of these autops autopsy reports. I know that the cause of death was listed as possible drowning, and no mention was made of water in the lungs. The use of the word possible is unfortunate and just adds fuel to the conspiracy that Willem was murdered. The private pathologist was Professor Simon from the University of Pretoria. He was also the person that did an autopsy on River Steenkamp. And his report stated that he could not precisely determine the cause of death, but that drowning must be considered the primary cause of death. It has been said by some couch pathologist that because there was no water in the lungs that Willem didn't drown and that he therefore must have been dead even before he entered the water. There is such a thing as dry drowning. And when someone drowns, with, that is when someone drowns without water entering the lungs. I googled it and found the following. Not all drowning victims literally inhale water into the lungs. The extreme sensitivity of upper airway passages often causes a laryngeal spasm, sealing off and preventing water from entering the lungs. These spasms lead to dry drowning. I'm not saying that's what happened here. I'm just trying to make the point that any argument that Willem was already dead before he entered the river because there was no water in the lungs just doesn't have any merit or any scientific certainty. Now, in my past investigations, especially into the murder of Inga Lodz, I have studied several forensic and autopsy reports, and I can tell you that the word possible is often misused when the author is too afraid or unwilling to, under oath, commit to a fact. We must remember that these autopsy reports become Section 212 affidavits if, when presented to court, becomes prima facie evidence. It must be accepted as the truth unless either one of the parties can show otherwise. So when it comes to making oaths, they rather err on the side of caution. But when you speak to them off the record, they would have no problem telling you the firm conviction of the fact. Let me give you an example. This towel was found at the crime scene of the murder of Inga Lodz, meters away from her body that was covered in blood. To you and me and most people, we would agree that this is blood and hair on a towel. We've all seen blood and know what it looks like. 
The laboratory analyst tested the tower of luminol, uh, presumptive test for blood, and the luminol reacted as one would expect luminol to react with blood. And yet the forensic report only indicated the possible presence of blood and a possible presence of hair on the towel. In light of the above, I would caution against anyone attaching too much weight to the word possible. Now the autopsy report all also seems to mention the presence of bruises on the scalp at the front and back of the head, as well as bleeding in the left and right of the skull base. I don't know for sure, but I assume what they observed was a subdural hematoma. This develops when there is bleeding between the brain and the skull, and often a result of a head injury. And, and it doesn't have to be a severe head injury, as even minor bumps to the head can lead to a subdural hematoma. It should be noted that no mention is made of lacerations, which one would expect if Willem was assaulted with an object that would deliver a concentrated force, such as a hammer, a pipe, or a rock, for example. Now, it's not impossible that Willem sustained the head injuries prior to getting into the truck, perhaps during a physical altercation of some kind in the parking lot outside the bar, which may explain why he may have driven away at such a high speed. Nothing that I've said so far in my video precludes the possibility of an incident in a parking lot. I am, however, not aware of any concrete evidence to this effect. Remember, there were a lot of people in the lodge at night and some of them stayed in chalets close to the bar. And no, an empty bullet cartridge or damage to someone else's vehicle or someone trying to call his wife nine times that night, simply not sufficient evidence to make accusations of foul play against any person. I look forward to seeing the police's evidence and why they think some people committed perjury and what lies were supposedly told. I think it's quite likely that you may sustain one or more head injuries after driving a truck into a river that is flooding. Perhaps he was, wasn't wearing his seatbelt and when he first hit the water, he was flung forward with his head first into the screen, windscreen. And perhaps when he broke the windscreen, the water rushed in and pushed him back with such force that he bumped the back of his head. I'm not saying that's exactly what happened. My aim is simply to present some plausible alternatives. Because if there's a, a reasonably plausible alternative, then you cannot accept the conjecture of an assault as a fact. In the report article, the police alleged that the truck with Willem's body was placed in the river the day before it was found. That would be the evening of Monday, the 21st of November. They claim that they have previously thoroughly searched the area where the truck was found and that they are convinced that the truck wasn't there. Now, I've already talked about some of the shortcomings in the search method they used. Now let's look at this allegation logically and with a sober mind. Proponents of the theory want us to believe that Willem was somehow killed after he left the bar that morning, and that Willem and his truck were hidden somewhere for nine days, all the while while his body was decomposing, before they brought it back to the lodge and then pushed or placed it into the river, while it was in park and with the handbrake pulled up. Just think about that for a moment. They claim the truck was pushed into the river while the park, while it was in park and the handbrake pulled up. And before doing that, they broke the windscreen, opened the rear window and placed the key on the floor. We know the truck wasn't hidden on the lot's property. That would have been extremely, that would have been an extremely risky endeavor which no sane person would have attempted to undertake, given that it's an absolute certainty that the police and others would have undertaken a detailed search of the property, and that's exactly what transpired. The property was searched and nothing was found. That means the truck must have been removed from a property in a manner that could not be detected by CCTV cameras or anyone else. So if we assume that they did manage to get a truck off the property undetected, they had to drive it to a place where they could hide the truck without it being noticed by anyone. CTV cameras or helicopters doing aerial surveillance. 
They had to know it was going to be in the news and that everyone was going to be in the lookout for this truck. But first they had to disable the truck's GPS tracker. Because an analysis of the truck's GPS tracker data showed its last location to be at the lodge. Obviously, if Willem drove the truck into the water, it would likely have caused the GPS tracker to stop working. That is normally what happens when you submerge electronics, electronic devices in water. So the truck was hidden for nine days. What did they do with Willem's body during this time? Did they put it in water? Because when the body was removed from the truck through the front window, it was bloated. It was floating. It showed signs of decomposition and discoloration of the skin. That's consistent with being in the in water for a period of time. Then I assume under the cover of darkness, they drove the truck to the river's edge. That Monday night, the moon was a waning crescent uh, with about 8% illuminated. And on a Tuesday, it was overcast. So it's safe to assume that it must have been quite dark and would have been, and it would have been possible to drive to the river's edge or to push the truck into the water without lights. We know where the truck was found. The question is where would they have pushed the truck in from? Now, if we assume that the windscreen was already broken before the truck was pushed into the water, the water would have entered the cabin very quickly and it would have caused the truck to sink almost immediately. It is safe to assume that the truck would have been pushed into the river in the same location where it was pulled out from. The only other alternative is to have pushed it in from a location somewhere inside the lodge property. And that doesn't make sense because that would have been extremely risky. Even so, right here adjacent to the lodge property, this would have been an extremely risky endeavor. As there would have been many campers, there, there could have been campers or staff that could have noticed the strange goings on and they could have raised the alarm. This is the camping ground area and you can see the fence and the red arrow shows the location where someone, someone most likely would have had to push the truck into the river. Behind this photo, the terrain slopes upwards towards the bar and people would have had a good view down to this location. Contrary to what some people may think, the truck wasn't found in the shallow waters close to the bank. It was found deeper, as can be seen from this photo. So with the truck in park and a handbrake brought on, the truck was pushed down this embankment and they must have gotten into the water to push the truck further to this location, where it is so deep you can hardly stand in the water. Are we to believe there was a vehicle on the other side of the river that would have pulled the truck in? which means that they had to get the tow rope across the river. How? Did someone swim across the river in darkness while it was still flowing fast? Or did someone use a bow and arrow to shoot the pull string across? Ladies and gentlemen, you must realize how difficult or impossible this must have been. And quite frankly, it's absurd to believe something like this. And leaving no marks on the bank that the search party could have noticed the next morning, just a few hours later. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you of the principle of OCAM's razor. From a competing set of explanations, the simplest one is in most cases the best one. The simple explanation is that in a bad storm, in the dark, after attending a stag party at which alcohol was consumed, Willem accidentally drove into the river. It was a mistake. Afterward, the flood waters covered the tracks of where the truck entered the river. And when the flood levels receded, the tracks, the tracks became visible and the truck was found at a location where one would expect it to be found, some distance downstream from where the tracks were found. And inside was the body of Willem, showing signs of drowning and being submerged in water for a while. The complicated explanation is that somehow Willem was killed. His truck and body were removed from a premises and hidden for nine days. And then under the cover of darkness, the truck and his body were brought back to the premises. Where it was pushed deep into the river while the back wheels were locked by the handbrake and transmission. You choose which version makes more sense.
I just want to leave you with a few last words. The pursuit of justice is a noble endeavor. But to get to justice, you need to walk in the light of truth as according to the facts, not according to your own personal opinion or your gut feeling or whatever you want the truth to be for your own personal reasons. If you don't walk in the light of truth, you may end up in a very dark place called injustice, where your words and your actions, your Facebook posts, your Instagram posts may cause real harm to innocent people. And that's not acceptable, not in the eyes of society, nor in the eyes of God. May I suggest that instead of praying for justice, for God to punish people that may not even exist, perhaps you should first pray for the truth to be known, whatever it may be, and also for the courage for you to accept the truth, even if it's inconvenient to you. The truth matters more than justice. With these words, I leave you, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time.